them for. Uh, please advise Centro of anything is established. Let me say at the, at the, at right now that I never knew Martin Sastry. I saw him when he was brought in to be booked. I have nothing against the man. No, he had been under suspicion for some time. Before they even made the arrest, they knew a lot about the background of Sastry. Martin Sastry, I think, had a feeling that he was in trouble. At the time of his trial, he did everything to disrupt them. He uh, shouted, and he wanted to be his own attorney, and anybody that got up and didn't uh, said things about him, he disrupted the trial. It got so bad that they had to, the judge had to gag him, and he actually was gagged. And that's the first time that's ever been done in the city of Buffalo. Pretty brilliant guy when it comes to that, to raising issues. A man like Sastry, if he put his mind and did the right thing, he could have, a man like him could be a good lawyer. Because I think he's a pretty bright guy. I, I really do. I think that Martin Sastry was no dumbbell. He's a pretty smart potato. in Buffalo, in the Negro sections of the city, and considerable numbers of persons were arrested. There were a considerable number of persons who were wounded, and uh, police at the time told me when they brought Sastry in that he was, they felt that he was one of the men who was responsible for a lot of the trouble in Buffalo, a lot of the disturbances. In the summer of 1967, the black ghetto of Buffalo, New York, like so many others around the country that year, erupted in violent rebellion. Storefronts and houses were looted and burned, and business in the Cold Springs ghetto came to a virtual standstill. There was one notable exception to this shutdown. That was the Afro-Asian bookstore, owned and run by Martin Sastre, a black ex-convict. Sastre's political bookstore remained open, and ghetto residents found refuge there from the tear gas and bullets of the city's police. Several days after the rebellion died down, Sastry was arrested and charged with selling heroin. He denied those charges and claimed he was being railroaded because of his radical activism in Buffalo's black ghetto. Local papers portrayed Sastry as a dangerous black militant and a white hater, as well as a leader of the ghetto rebellion. He was convicted of the dope charge by an all-white jury and sentenced to 41 years in jail. Martin Sastre has been in jail since that summer of 1967 always claiming his innocence and maintaining he was framed. Yeah, well, uh, I had a couple of visits, uh, one from the FBI and uh, one from the, uh, well, I don't think there were a state, state police that come in and uh, looked over the literature and asked me, how come, I said, you're looking for trouble. Uh, why do you want to sell this type of stuff? You know, I said, because I have a constitutional right to sell this kind of stuff. You know? He says, well, you can get better stuff to sell than this communist stuff. I says, look, I have a constitutional right to sell this, and nobody determines what type of books that I sell. He said, well, if you're looking for trouble, it's all right with you, and they walked out. At the time, I was chief of the Narcotic Bureau of the Buffalo Police Department, and as such that uh, our main function was to arrest violators of the narcotic drug laws, especially those that would sell narcotic drugs. And uh, Sastry was a substantial peddler. There was no doubt about it. Uh, we had had many, many complaints from the different people. Our intelligence information from our various informants and others absolutely ascertained this. Uh, he was uh, he investigated, wasn't... arrested, 
and uh, successfully prosecuted, and now, of course, uh, sentenced to 30 to 40 years, and this mm -hmm. is where we are now. I was working at the night he was arrested, and uh, when he was brought in, uh, the police at the time told me all about him. Well, they told me that uh, in a basement, under his Afro-American bookstore, they had found a considerable number of Molotov cocktails, which they felt were being made and manufactured in this basement. And I have a copy of an article you wrote on July 15, and the title of the article was Man Held as Insider of Trouble. Now, that's what the police told you when they first brought him in, but was the fact that there were Molotov cocktails in his basement ever brought out in court? He was not charged with uh, a setting a riot because I don't think the, pl the police could prove that he had anything to do with the inciting of a riot or being the leader of younger folks to throw and destroy property with co Molotov cocktail bomb. Therefore, he never came to trial on it. relations in the world, which we have had ever since... That's on, that's on camera. All right, go ahead. Uh, we've had good relations. We've had a few troublemakers around, a few agitators. And uh, if a, a, a leader gets up and he screams about police brutality, he gets an audience. This is what they want to hear. They might Why, have chief. I don't know. It's more rough? Chief, what? Somebody. Shortly after Martin Sastre's arrest, Buffalo Police Commissioner Frank Felicetta went to Washington to testify before Senate Internal Security Subcommittee. At those hearings, the commissioner referred to Sastre as Martin X, and he labeled Sastre, quote, a prominent figure in the recent disorders in our city. Felicetta told the committee that a raid on Sastre's home on Jefferson Avenue had uncovered considerable evidence of, quote, equipment for arson and riot incitement. Felicetta's allegations about Sastre were completely unsubstantiated, but they were featured prominently on the front pages of Buffalo's major newspapers, only three days before a county grand jury was scheduled to consider an indictment in the Sastre case. After the arrest, and uh, in this instance, and uh, Martin Sostry making the several allegations that he did, that we went deeper into his background, something we don't normally do because we have so many uh, investigations that we uh, conduct. But when uh, Martin Sostry made it a point that uh, with the uh, way out allegations that he uh, constantly made, then uh, the commissioner and myself as chief crim, uh, chief of uh, the narcotic bureau had made in-depth investigation and background. And so far as any uh, uh, subversive activities prior to that, they might have been something of just general knowledge and nothing that uh, uh, caused uh, the Buffalo Police Department at the time to make any particular uh, special investigation into. Martin Sostry was arrested uh, by our department because of his involvement in sale of narcotic drugs. He was convicted, there's no doubt in my mind, uh, by the jury because of the sale of narcotic drugs, period. Buffalo in the late 1960s was, like a lot of other places, it was mostly scared. And it was scared in a funny way because it had, the people in it who were scared were the people who controlled the town. That is, the, the ethnic groups which had been in political control of the town for a long time, mostly the Italians and the, and the Poles, who, who suddenly felt as if everything which they had established was, was being threatened, on the one hand, by the black community, which was, as black communities go, not very militant really in this town, and especially, I think, for a while by the uh, university community, which was fairly militant. And uh, what, what, what Buffalo decided to do was, was, was to use the police, not primarily for law enforcement in you know, some abstract sense, but uh, just to maintain the political status quo. So the, the cops were sent out uh, to, to carry out what was essentially political harassment, but some cover was needed for it. And, uh, and the cover which, which was found was, of course, drugs. 
Martin came to Buffalo in October of 1964 upon his release from Attica State Prison and saved up some money to, to rent the storefront, fix it up. And it was on Jefferson between Woodlawn and Ferry, which is really the, the heart of the black ghetto. He sold um, a lot of black nationalist writings, jazz records, soul records, African carvings. He was the only place in um, this whole area where you could get anti-Vietnam War literature. This was the Afro-Asian bookstore from about March 1965 to July 15, 1967. This was the first of three bookstores that Martin Sostra opened in Buffalo. And this is where he was arrested uh, about midnight on July 15, 1967. Uh, from the time he got busted in Buffalo in 1968, they sent him and brought him to uh, Attica. They brought him up to the box. He never hit population. He hit uh, Greenhaven. They transferred him to Greenhaven, and they had him there for 30 days. He went straight to the box for helping a brother, because the brother asked him about some legal, you know, uh, material that he didn't understand. The brother is not uh, an idol. We looked up to the brother because the brother is like a, a teacher. That I met Martin Sussman in Walker when he was when he got put in Walker. At that time, he came from the federal court. Now, when I met the brother there, we got together, and he was like a teacher to us, you know, because we had a group of 25 people, and like he used to have his books in there. He had his books in there, and then we used to like read the books. And, and, and really, you know, get down together with what's happening because at that time, you know, the awareness that I had wasn't that together until I met the brother. And the brother, he was a great inspiration not only to to, uh, to me or to the brother, but to many people because he's a brilliant man. Not only that, he, he looks out for all, all, all of them that are in jail and for those that are here. This is such a general, almost everyone in prison uh, considers him, you know, that has any political awareness, considers him or, or considers himself a political prisoner. However, I distinguish between a political prisoner in his classical sense and a politicized prisoner, one who has become politically aware while in prison, even though the original crime that he committed was not a political crime. Are many prisoners being politicized? Yes, many, many. Many prisoners, especially now since they have to let in a certain amount of literature. That was why I fought that case so hard, uh, Sostry versus Otis. Uh, that opened up the door to uh, letting in political literature, which uh, before that uh, was banned. And uh, even though they don't like it and they try to slow it down and hold it up while it's examined, uh, there's more uh, political literature now than ever. But I want to know, has uh, there been any plans or has it been discussed of getting uh, the men out of cages and having a, a more humane system in dealing with, uh, with uh, the humanity, like, just like the visitor's room? You here, you right, visiting your mother. Let me let me let me, let me describe this. Thing at a time. Let me describe. Let me uh, finish describing you, the visitors' room where you can't visiting. see and hear at the same time. In other words, they have a small glass uh, partition, a small glass window where if you speak, they have the speaker down. So if you speak, you can't look. You have to speak like that. So when the other party speaks, I think that's an they have to go down. And uh, this is very barbaric. Even in we, the uh, state, we don't have, we have a screen. We don't have dungeons here. Uh, Mr. Sastry is referring to single cells. We have no dormitories here. Everybody has a single cell with a toilet, wash bowl, and bed in it. It has a light in it. Oh, I should like to know where it is that you have uh, cells that have lights because uh, none of the floors that I've been in have well, you're cells in, you're in a witness light. block and there are lights out in that area where you uh, are able to... Hall lights, not inside the cells. Inside, there's, well, one was torn out by your, the previous tenant uh, and uh, smashed and uh, et cetera in the same block you're in. Well, I was in A block on the regular gallery. They didn't have no lights and maybe well, there's this is something new there's that lights. you put light bulbs. You have actually lights in the cells with fixtures? Let me ask you a question. Uh, are the men able to sit out in the exercise area all day long? 
Well, we're getting away from the lights light. now. Uh, well, there's lighting is out inside, there. In the cell or outside? The lighting is out there. Oh, out there in the hall. Lights. Oh, that's, that's different. Out in the well, hall. There's no lights inside the cell. What you're advocating is evidently chandeliers in every cell no, in the jail. No, just well, the plain, it's not be done. plain ordinary. See, I made you get up off that lie, you know. There's no <laughs> lie. I mean, there's well, no least, lights in the at cell. Least we got past, <laughs> at least we got past the dungeon yeah. stage, you know. Well, call it the a cell. A hard cell. The tiger cells of Vietnam. I think uh, as unfortunate as it uh, certainly has been, uh, Attica has called attention to problems. Uh, now, whether this is the only way it could have been done, you know, it's kind of academic uh, to say that. I think uh, Commissioner Oswald uh, had been talking to people all over the state and uh, was doing, trying to do things. In regards to uh, Oswald, Oswald is now playing the role of the honest broker. In other words, he's caught in the middle and this and that. But uh, old timers like me and a lot of other prisoners remember him as being the goon that when you go up before the parole board and you have 20 years in, they hit you with two years. He says you're not ready for the street. Uh, he hit you with three years RO. He's not the honest broker. He's just a veritable Eichmann. He's the killer of the brothers in Attica, not only the brothers, but also of uh, revolutionary whites like Sam Melville. And uh, he's also the killer of his own guards, you know, who he had no regard for. And uh, he's responsible for that. He's responsible for all the crimes of prisoners that have died in prison uh, prior to Attica as a result of being hit by the parole board because they would not uh, cooperate with the parole board because they uh, refused to be made stool pigeons. I don't even want to be sitting next to a guy that would talk like that, to be honest with you. Yeah, and Mr. Oswald not being here to defend himself. I certainly don't agree with anything that was said. And uh, by my presence being here, if anybody would feel that I did, then I'd like to clear that up right now. Uh, it's just a prison. It's just a political... Uh ripoff where the warden uh, he's appointed by the governor it's a political plum the department of correction uh, deputies they got about five or six deputies even the deputies have deputies these are political plums and there's a hundred and twenty million dollar plum that they got to play with that's the uh, appropriation of the new york state prisons uh, which they can handle anywhere as a closed society. Nobody can come in and audit their books and see what they're doing, and, you know. Okay, the motion for a new trial for Martin Sostre depends on the testimony of convicted felon Arthur Williams. In 1968, he testified that in 67, under police surveillance, he had purchased heroin from Martin Sostre. That sent Sostre up for 30 to 40 years. Today, he's had a change of heart and a change of testimony. Now he says it was all a frame-up on his part so that he could get out of jail. In an exclusive interview with us, he told us his story as he's now telling it. Uh, as I try to convey to the court that uh, when I entered Martin, Martin Sostre's bookstore, that I did have drugs on my person and uh, I never bought any drugs from him. And well, How did you fool the police into believing you had bought drugs? I pretended to reach across the counter and Arto Williams filed an affidavit in April 1971, recanting his original testimony. In that affidavit, he wrote, quote, I gave Sastre the money, and I asked him to keep it for me. I had, on an earlier occasion, asked Sastre to keep a suit for me when I went to New York, fearing it might be stolen. He took the money, and I brought my hand up to my pocket, as if to put something in it. The plainclothesman was outside, at least 15 feet from where I was standing. The bag of drugs I had brought from the car was about an inch long, and three quarters of an inch wide. I never took it out of my pocket, and I believe he could not have seen it if I had. Exactly and briefly, what did you see the night uh, of the alleged drug buy in terms of that drug buy itself? Uh, I saw uh, Mr. Sastry pass uh, Mr. Williams the glassy envelope. In court today, it was pointed out that in your original affidavit, you hadn't mentioned seeing a glassy envelope. Uh, I wonder why. If you read the rest of the affidavit, it would be pointed out that it wasn't necessary to even indicate that it was a glassy envelope. 
There were only two eyewitnesses to the alleged drug transaction. Trooper Lewis Steverson, whose original affidavit never mentioned the glassine envelope being passed, and John Wilcox, a New York State police photographer, who testified in Martin's original trial that he had conducted surveillance of the bookstore from a dentist's window across the street. When asked to provide pictures of the transaction at Martin's trial, Wilcox stated that he had forgotten to load film in his camera. Nevertheless, he testified that he was able to observe through his camera at a distance of 80 feet a 1 and 7 eighths by 7 eighths inch glassine envelope being passed from Martin Sastre to Ardo Williams. Uh, Mr. Williams had called us. He was at jail at the time here at the Erie County Jail. He had called that he wanted to cooperate with us, and he had had information about a narcotic activity down on the Strip, down on Jefferson Avenue in the city of Buffalo. And certainly then I assigned uh, Sergeant Grismacher to talk to Mr. Williams, and uh, he so did. And Mr. Williams was knowledgeable. He had been an addict then, and I assume still is. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told uh, Sergeant Grismacher substantial information indicating uh, the various peddlers of narcotic drugs. And when Mr. Sastry's name came up, I was well aware of the many, many complaints I had received about his selling narcotic drugs that we commenced an investigation. According to his statement, for a while, he had got rid of his habit. He worked at the uh, Tom Est, which was a narcotic rehabilitation center. He told, he confessed of what he did here under the pressure of the heroin addict and the prison and whatnot. And in one of those old sessions, uh, somebody suggested that he made it make amends. He says, man, you put a, you framed the man, you, you know, uh, we understand uh, what I know. Because all of them are addicts, ex-addicts, we understand the pressure, but you know, but now that you're out of that pressure, what about that man's life? 40 years is equivalent to a lifetime of his age, his business and everything. Or now that you realize what you've done, what are you going to do? So I guess he said, what can I do? You know, and they said, well, why don't you try to tell the truth this time? Yes, uh, when Alvin Grismacher, Sergeant Grismacher picked me up, uh, I was under influence. I had shot quite a bit of drugs that night, and he was also aware that I was under the influence. I don't know if he was aware that I was setting Martian Social up or not. My impression, he didn't care, he just wanted to get in. And, uh, like, I never knew Martin Social sell drugs, and the first, thing I, first time I heard about it is when I talked to Grismarker. What did Chief Amico tell you? When he met you in the Buffalo Police Station, he made a remark about getting Sastra? Yes, he said, uh, we want Sastra, that you're willing to cooperate with us. We're going to help you with this case. And he told you you'd be out of jail the next day? Oh, definitely sort of guarantee. At the hearing today, the state tried to shake Williams' testimony that he lied and that he, in fact, framed up so straight. But the big surprise came today when the state produced a series of legal precedents indicating that even if Williams lied, if the police and prosecution were not aware of that fact at the time of the trial, then the conviction should not necessarily be overturned. It will be up to Judge Curtin to decide whether those legal precedents are applicable in this case. It will be also up to him to decide whether Mr. Williams, who said he was lying then, is telling the truth now. This is Henry Lawrence, Eyewitness News at the Federal Courthouse. From our investigation of the sentence which Mr. Soster received in Buffalo, we came away convinced that it was a frame-up, that he had been sent to prison because he was disseminating and selling books that the local government in Buffalo simply didn't like. Everything that's happened in Martin Soster's case since this time has only confirmed this conviction on the part of American Penn. We added Martin Soster's name to this list as the only prisoner in the United States who is a prisoner of conscience, a writer, or at least a man associated with the world of writing, in jail for his ideas. The clock chisels away the night breaking through toward dawn in minute flakes. The cell is painted with the life plus death non-color we call shadow, and shadows are echoes silence makes, quiet as melting ice. The cell is an imperfection on the seam of time, where now, for a clock's heartbeat, overlaps eternity. Where stars slip across a cell block window on the lubrication of thinning night, 
and daybreak pours through a slatted window on a waterfall of wind, and the clock chips on, pausing only to sound the alarm that night, and a little something more has gone. You know, I'm in a solitary confinement in a Clinton prison. I've been there since uh, December. Uh, they transferred me from the solitary confinement in uh, what they call segregation. They've changed their names now. The prisons are no longer prisons. They're facilities, correctional facilities. Uh, I understand they want to change the name of this joint. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they forgot. Well, while well, they're changing the name, they might as well name it the Waldorf, you know? <laughs> uh, I'm fighting the rectal examination issue, and I'm fighting the beard. I've had this quarter of an inch beard. Uh, in fact, I was wearing this outside. This has become fashionable now, especially in the ghetto. Uh, but uh, No, I don't smoke, thanks. But uh, I've had this for quite a few years. In 67, the police mugshots showed me like this. This is my identification. So now they want me to shave the beard off and uh, just wear the mustache. Uh, I claim that this is a personal right, that I have a constitutional right to wear uh, the beard. It's neat. It, uh, they can't say that it alters my identification because this is my identification. Uh, they can't say that the whole lice, because in the first place, there's no lice problem in the prison. In the second place, the lice would have a hard time thriving in such a short beard, just like they would up there. Uh, so uh, they don't have a leg to stand on. I have decisions on that. And now they have me in solitary confinement. They don't even let me have a straight pit. All I have in my cell are just law books, which I have on the floor because there's no furniture in the cell, just the bed. No table, no desk, no nothing. They won't let me have my typewriter. They won't let you have a fingernail file. Uh, just your toilet articles, which is only just the toothpaste and the toothbrush. No deodorant, no nothing. But yet they require that every time you leave your cell, the solitary confinement building, to go, let's say, to the hospital inside the prison, or to go to the visitor's room to see your attorney or to see your private visit, that you strip down naked, you bend over and spread your cheeks. Now, they know you don't have anything in your rectum. They just do this to dehumanize you. Because once a man bends over and spreads his cheek, there's two or three hacks leering at you. That's a sign of not only of submission, but a symbolic of being sodomized. And a lot of prisoners submit to that, but I'm not going to submit. If a brother speak up for somebody or look out for another one, and we say together, you know, they don't dig this. But if we all there playing cards and reading short hikes and might be playing with ourselves in the, in the cell, it's all right. You know, but that's not what we want. What we want is liberty, freedom, economically, socially, and politically. That's where it's at. And that's what the brother represents. So Mr. Rockefeller is over in his tower and we're trying to remind him that he's left a bloody trail of prisoners and slain prisoners and guards and that Martin Sostry is part of that Rockefeller record and we don't want him forgotten. Free my